F-16 Fighting Falcon. Lightweight with the power of a heavyweight. High technology with economy and reliability. Outbombing the world's finest strike aircraft while dominating the sky. It's not a contradiction. It's the F-16, creating a new standard for performance and readiness. A highly maneuverable 9G airframe with a fully integrated heads-up cockpit, unparalleled acceleration. It's a fighter pilot's airplane with the range to get to the fight, the persistence to stay in the fight, and the firepower to win the fight. competition in 1975 and is now well established with major commands of the U.S. Air Force as well as a number of overseas air arms. The F-16 Fighting Falcon is clearly one of the most important fighter aircraft to have made its debut in recent years. Well over 1,400 F-16s have rolled off the production line at General Dynamics in Fort Worth, Texas and another 400 from lines in Belgium and the Netherlands. It's anticipated the U.S. Air Force will eventually receive about 2,800 aircraft, while foreign exports currently account for some 1,100 machines delivered or on order. At Hill Air Force Base, in its first operational readiness inspection, the F-16 demonstrated the best air-to-surface accuracies of any ORI ever. During inspections at Hill and at Nellis, the F-16's capabilities were rated either excellent or outstanding. The Fighting Falcon is setting new standards for readiness. Mission-capable rates are higher for the F-16 than any other U.S. Air Force fighter. The adage, high technology won't fly, is no longer true. Reliability is an integral part of the F-16. In addition to operational readiness, the F-16 has been tested in environments like Red Flag, Maple Flag, Green Flag, and Coronet Falcon. Each has dramatically proven the F-16's operational readiness. Worldwide deployment bare base operation, 15-minute quick turns, and sortie effectiveness rates above 90%. All have been proven. These aren't promises. They're operational results. Based on performance, the F-16 was selected to represent Tactical Air Command at the RAF bombing competition in Mossymouth, Scotland. Competing against Jaguars, Buccaneers, and F-111s, the F-16 was matched against some of the world's finest strike aircraft. There were 
two mission types. One to navigate 450 miles at low altitude to hit an airfield, and the other to interdict a battlefield convoy. Defending the targets were four rapier surface-to-air missile systems and as many as 24 RAF Lightning and F-4 Phantom interceptor aircraft. Traditional, strike aircraft fly low to the terrain using masking techniques to evade air-to-air -air interception. The F-16s, however, employed a new tactic. They went on the offensive, fighting their way in with dramatic success. The aggressors are entering, entering the airspace at this time, 260, 56. We got an F-14 behind us, break it left. Okay, break, Gordon, down. <laughs> I think you're right, 4 o'clock. Yeah, Charlie Hill, his nose isn't on me, but I'm in deep trouble here. Okay, he's got about 50 to go with his nose. Okay, drag Okay, okay, okay. Okay, he's pitched off on the Mabry at back starboard, dog. That's true, you're about to get gunned. Oh, what a beautiful shot. He's coming out from that He's way below us. He's out of the way. Let's knock this one off. How did you knock it off? So I'm about to lock it off. I think we pressed him pretty good that time. In all. The F-16s killed 88 aggressor aircraft. By comparison, the next best team had just one air-to-air -air kill. Best of all, the F-16 team was the only team to put all bombs on target, beating the strike aircraft at what they do best, including navigation without error to the target, weapons delivery with pinpoint accuracy, ingress to and egress from the target in complete control of the sky. General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon, the 21st century fighter, is ready now. The F-16, an aerodynamic masterpiece, tested and proven superior for today's air combat arena. Optimized for high lift, low drag, and maneuverability. A small, lightweight airframe, driven by an extremely efficient high thrust engine. With a thrust to weight ratio of greater than one, the F-16 can sustain a 9G turn. In the air combat arena, the F-16 pilot commands an aerodynamic machine designed to outturn and out-accelerate any other fighter in the world today. The F-16 combines aerodynamic superiority with a versatile external payload of up to 15,000 pounds, enabling it to swing quickly from an air superiority role to a wide range of air-to-ground operations. Add to this a remarkable operational range, and the result is a multi-role fighter with the striking power and versatility to be responsive to any combat task. The F-16's unique design generates great fighting range and endurance with the speed, agility, and power to win. The F-16's combat supremacy begins with the rugged, responsive airframe, but underneath the F-16 contains one of the most advanced digital avionic designs ever, giving the pilot quick reaction and fingertip control over all flight parameters, from precise, rapid pre-flight programming to highly accurate all-weather weapons delivery. Roger, Tario, I've got one, and he's in a left-hand turn. It looks like the lizard. I'm picking it up. 
Okay, I got a target on the other one. He's uh, further off to my left. I'll take him if you've got the lizard. Roger, I've got the lizard. Roger, I've engaged on the other one. Radar and fire control computations transmitted to the head-up display allow the F-16 pilot to deliver all air-to-air -air and air-to-ground weapons without looking away from the target and without removing his hands from the flight controls. Employing the F-16 fire control system, the pilot can manage and deliver his diversified weapons with ease and accuracy. In this instance, the pilot selects an air-to-ground delivery mode on the store's control panel. As soon as his choice is made, the fire control computer sets up the radar, the HUD, and the firing sequence for the delivery mode selected. The fire control computer precisely and continuously computes air-to-ground ordnance range, displaying this on the HUD. This frees the pilot to maneuver right up to weapon delivery without loss of accuracy. enhances combat responsiveness and reduces pilot workload is the dogfight missile override switch located on the throttle. This one switch permits the pilot, should he encounter an air-to-air -air threat, to instantly change his fire control system from air to surface to air to air. You guys coming back forward to about uh, 190. That's full. Right, you got a 38 off your right, 2 o'clock, 5. Come over. Clear turning. The Hawks got the tally on him. Okay, tally on one's pass on my left side now. One coming up on you. There's one coming behind me, high. Okay, that's five down below. Should get him to seven? Yep. Okay. That's on the channel. Once the air to air threat is no longer a factor, the same switch will return the fire control system to the air to surface mode. The F-16 design minimizes maintenance time and cost. Extensive use of built-in tests and status indicators quickly isolates malfunctions. Rapid repair is then made possible by removable modules. Ease of maintenance is also made possible by 228 quick access panels and hinged doors that can be opened with only four tools. Simple, low-cost maintenance adds up to greater F-16 performance in the air. 16 to me is a godsend because of the ease of maintenance we have associated at this time. We've got a lot, a lot of young people in the Air Force these days, and it's making my job a lot easier to be upgrading these young people to where they're proficient aircraft maintenance in a very short period of time. The design features of the F-16 enable ground crews to meet quick turnaround times. The lower fuel load, afforded by lightweight single-engine design, actually permits turnaround times of 15 minutes or less. he starts the F-16 with its internal self-starter. The pilot commands a combat fighter, designed and engineered for the greatest ease of handling ever built.
extended wing and body produce greater lift, lower structural weight, and greater fuel capacity. A high visibility, high G cockpit for greater pilot comfort and performance. A high thrust to weight ratio for shorter takeoff rolls and greater acceleration. flight control system that maximizes handling qualities, permitting the pilot to easily attain the tremendous performance of the F-16. Automatic leading edge flaps for maximizing lift and stability. Designed to outturn, engineered to endure, and armed to dominate. The F-16 means air supremacy. Radar worked like a charm. The weapons delivery system was right on. Bird handled so well in the pattern. It's just a pleasure to fly. I really enjoy it. The F-16 is uh, very easy for me to handle as crew chief because everything I have to handle, I can reach from the ground. The bird's a flyer. It's a maintainable flyer. In air to surface, it'll match any computer bombing system. And in air to air, it's unmatched. It's a, quite a machine, a hell of a machine to fly, and uh, I'm sure that there are going to be uh, some happy people in the future when they get into this airplane. The F-16 Fighting Falcon is, in terms of dollar-earning capability, arguably the most successful U.S. fighter ever. The massive U.S. Air Force orders being accompanied by highly lucrative export sales. Indeed, with production for the overseas market currently assured of surpassing the 1,000 mark, and with reorders and new customers still very much in prospect, it might well be fair to say the sky is the limit with regard to the future of the F-16. Formal announcement of selection of the F-16 came in early June 1975, when it was revealed the initial European buy would cover 348 aircraft. At that time, Belgium anticipated procurement of 104 F-16A single-seaters and 12 F-16B two-seaters, although this was later revised to 96 F-16As and 20 F-16Bs. Corresponding figures for the other three nations were Denmark 46 and 12, the Netherlands 80 and 22, and Norway 60 and 12. Subsequent reorders have now raised the number to be produced in Europe above the 500 mark. Apart from one or two aircraft diverted to customers such as Egypt, all have been handed over to the four members involved in the co-production program. Hardly surprisingly, some changes were embodied during the course of F-16A and B production. Perhaps the most visible evidence of this process concerning the horizontal tail surfaces, which were enlarged to provide enhanced longitudinal control greater gross weights. Some aircraft also featured an extended tail fairing to accommodate a braking parachute. This installation was standard on those examples for Norway right from the start and may be added to F-16s of certain other air arms as part of the enhancement effort. In 1987, General Dynamics submitted an offer to the Air Force for an upgraded version of the F-16 called the Agile Falcon that could be produced jointly with the four European nations already a part of the F-16 program. The Agile Falcon proposal calls for increasing the F-16's wing size from 300 to 375 square feet and adding another 7.5 feet to the wingspan to improve the aircraft's lift and maneuverability. The modifications are seen as a complement to currently planned upgrades, which include an increased performance engine and advanced avionics. Belgium, Denmark, Norway, and the Netherlands have expressed an interest in replacing their older F-16A models in the mid-1990s, and if the Agile Falcon program is approved, development would begin in 1990 with the first production aircraft delivery in 1995. Are European pilots excited about flying the F-16? You can judge for yourself. I, I was in the F-16, the front seat, 
And I said, what do I want to do now? I wanted to do this maneuver, and I did it, and it was perfect. And uh, it really was a joy to do it. As far as operational employment is concerned, the honor of being the first combat-ready unit in Europe was claimed by number 349 squadron at Beauvauchamps, Belgium, in January 1981. And with the flow of aircraft accelerating steadily, by late summer of that same year, the Fighting Falcon was already well established in service with all four members of the European Consortium. To date, more than 15 foreign countries have purchased or ordered the Fighting Falcon. It's like a uh, Spitfire and, uh, and uh, it's equipped like a DC-10. Looking at the F-16C from the outside, there are only a few very subtle changes from the F-16A. But inside, the airplane is brand new, and it incorporates all the latest fighter technologies. Major changes have been made in the F-16C cockpit. These are designed to improve operational capability and flexibility. Directly in front of me is a new wide-angle heads-up display. It provides the pilot with all the flight information and weapons aiming cues he needs to keep his head out of the cockpit and on his target. The new HUD also has a raster capability for displaying a 25-degree field of view of infrared image. With an appropriate sensor, the pilot can navigate and deliver weapons by using the infrared imagery displayed on the HUD. Directly below the HUD is the integrated control panel. It's placed for easy upfront access to the navigation computer, radios, and the forward-looking infrared system. On both sides of this are two independent multifunction displays. They provide weapon and sensor control and large format displays of air-to-air -air and air-to-surface radar information, various sensor imagery, weapons and stores management data, as well as built-in test data. Prior to flight, all of the mission navigation, communication, and identification data, plus target and weapon information, are loaded onto this cassette. The pilot then inserts the cassette into the console receptacle and all of the mission information is automatically loaded into the onboard systems. Of course, the pilot can modify that information at any time by using the upfront control panel. As in the F-16A, key controls are arranged so that the pilot, while in combat, can operate with his hands on the stick and throttle. For example, if while navigating or attacking a ground target, the pilot sees an airborne threat, he can switch to an air combat mode, automatically obtain a radar lock, destroy that enemy aircraft with an air-to-air -air missile or the gun, and then return to the original mode, all without moving his hands from the stick or throttle. Well, now let's get in the air. It's time to see these systems in operation. Just like the F-16A, the F-16C is easy to start. No external support equipment is required. We only use one switch to turn on the battery and another switch to start the jet fuel starter. Thirty seconds later, the engine is up to idle speed and the pilot begins his pre-flight checks and aligning the inertial navigation set. The entire process, from start to takeoff, can take less than one minute but today we'll take it a little bit easier. With the data transfer equipment, the entire mission can be loaded into the aircraft systems in only five seconds.
In the air-to-air -air role, the F-16C provides two key improvements, an upgraded detection capability and a new missile. The new advanced technology APG-68 radar with track while scan features has been added, allowing the F-16C to track 10 targets simultaneously. As targets enter the area defended by the F-16C, the radar detects intruders far beyond visual range. A computer interprets the threat priority and displays target information, along with friendly forces and steering data. The APG-68 will incorporate a new mode called Raid Cluster Resolution. Using the Doppler shift of airborne targets flying in tight formation, the F-16C can determine if there's more than one target in a radar beam width, giving the pilot a better ability to set up his attack. advantage of this improved radar, a new beyond visual range missile ability is provided. The advanced medium range air-to-air -air missile, AMRAM, receives steering information from the target computer and after launch, mid-course updates from the radar guided to the target. The aircraft fire control computer can support several of these missiles at the same time, giving the F-16 true multi-shot ability. In the aircraft's air-to-surface attack role, significant improvements have also been made. The new radar's mapping mode has been improved through Doppler beam sharpening techniques from a ratio of 8 to 1 in the F-16A to 64 to 1 in the F-16C, giving the pilot much better resolution for all targets. Using the Doppler beam sharpening mode in conjunction with the radar bombing system, Accurate weapon delivery is possible at night or through an overcast sky. such as tanks and trucks, the APG-68 radar incorporates a ground-moving target indicator and track mode. In this mode, only moving targets are displayed. In the maritime role, a sea mode is employed to detect ships in various sea states for equal accuracy in sea surveillance and attack. While the F-16A has already demonstrated its excellent survivability in combat, the C's self-protection systems are further enhanced. Included is the ASPJ, a sophisticated radar detection and jamming system, plus an improved radar warning receiver. Upon detection of the threat's radar operation, electronic jamming and or dispensing of chaff or flares are done automatically. In addition, these systems are internal, eliminating the aerodynamic drag previously caused by external electronic countermeasure pods. Starting in 1986, C models with common engine bays were delivered. This allows the F-16C to be equipped with either the Pratt & Whitney F-100-220 engine or the General Electric F-110-100 engine. Unrestricted throttle movement, no engine trim requirements, and reduced life cycle costs are but a few of the benefits of these engines. When the time comes to fight, will it be ready? The F-16's record says it will, and the Air Force's director of the F-16 Systems Program Office agrees. The F-16 Worldwide Tactical Air Command Mission Capable Rate has exceeded 80% in each of the last 15 weeks, and that accomplishment is unprecedented in U.S. Air Force history. Also, the F-16, the world's most advanced electronics fighter, now has the highest reliability of any aircraft in the U.S. Air Force inventory. This, then, is the heritage of the F-16C, evolved from the best multi-role day fighter aircraft in the free world, retaining the agility, low fixed cost, 
and record-setting reliability of the F-16A. With built-in growth space, an improved cockpit, increased all-weather operability, expanded weapons flexibility, and exceptional reliability, the F-16 is able to strike and fight anytime, anywhere, day or night. For as long as there have been combat pilots, they've practiced dogfighting and ground attack missions. Using real weapons to practice on the ground attack ranges can get expensive in no time. And using real weapons while practicing dogfighting with your friends won't leave you with many friends for very long. Cubic Corporation of San Diego has developed a system that solves these problems. By placing instrumentation on the ground or on the ocean's surface, and by attaching a pod on the participating aircraft, which continuously informs the control center of where that aircraft is, it becomes possible to monitor and later replay the action. The computer combines the data and can produce a visual representation of the view from the cockpit of any of the aircraft. It can also provide viewpoints on the ground or in the air. And these can be moved so the operator can, in effect, fly or drive through the fight as it's occurring. Supplemented by remote controlled TV cameras, the system also computes data for simulating weapons release. This enables judges and the pilots to see who shot who down or who hit what target without any actual firing or dropping of weapons. An inexperienced pilot can be shown the view from the cockpit of the plane that shot him down so he can see how the attack developed. It's well documented, the more missions a pilot has flown, the greater his odds of survival become. Let's watch as Cubic's tactical air crew training system records a live air combat training mission as F-16s go head-to-head -head with F-14 Tomcats in the skies above Naval Air Station Fallon, Nevada. Fight zone, F-16s out of the east, two F-14s from the Navy out of the west. Number five takes a shot on number two. Number two becomes aware that he's fired upon makes a turn to drag the missile to the north. Second element is blue, attempting to cancel. Notice there's a considerable amount of fly-out time for the missile when it's taking its longer ranges. Number two has made his estimate of the missile approach time. He's made his turn back into the missile to cause the overshoot. Missile does overshoot, miss, Second element is repositioning in the pen. Element number one is able to take the offensive, begins to drive the fight. Five and six are reacting to one, maintaining good mutual support. Second blue element is back into the fight, again with good mutual support. Assisting with a shot. The blue shots won't show because of instrumentation. Blue one takes a shot on red six. And five is exited the fight. And two elements in blue against the one red. He's attempting to leave the fight, gain separation. Again, maintaining good mutual support on the blue. Element one of the blue presses the attack. Second element X to the east. One is attempting to engage with six as five repositions in the verse. You'll see number one close the shot on number six. Takes a missile shot. Again, there'll be no fly out. Instrumentation. 
Six turns, they pass close to the board, approximately 180 out. Blue one continues to climb into the vertical, attempting to reposition. And the, here you see a cockpit view of number five, as he's repositioning the fight to meet the support. Attempt to take a gunshot. Takes his high, high deflection gunshot here, and then overshoots the outside. Continues to press the fight. Second element has exited to the east, and the red changes to the blue element. Cockpit view of blue number five as he's repositioned to assist his buddy number six. You see the missile fly out, missiles off the rail. Second missile's off the rail, and the blue coffin indicates a kill. Five continues to press the attack. As six attempts to, or as number one attempts to separate. Red element regains mutual support. And attempts to separate. pilot, like any soldier on the field of battle, needs an edge to survive. 5,000 years of military history have demonstrated repeatedly the only true edge on which a soldier can rely is his training. The ultimate accolade for any Navy or Marine fighter pilot is to be selected for training at the Navy Fighter Weapons School at Miramar Naval Air Station, California, otherwise known as Top Gun. Fightertown USA added another dynamic addition to its repertoire when in June of 1987, the first of 26 F-16s arrived to become Top Gun's new supersonic adversary aircraft. The F-16N is a modified version of the Air Force's F-16C, and it will be simulating such threats as the Soviet MiG-29 and Su-27 in the air combat training. Until now, the Navy's adversary aircraft were not comparable to the generation of threat aircraft currently being flown. The Navy selected the F-16N because of its high performance and modern avionics. Modifications include the removal of the F-16's 20mm gun and replacement of the APG-68 radar with the Westinghouse APG-66. One of the most important goals of Top Gun is to instill Navy and Marine pilots with a sense of self-confidence. In the air, it's this quality that convinces the fighter pilot that he's better than the opposition. While self-confidence is not unique to fighter pilots, it's especially critical to them, because in their hands alone is an unforgiving supersonic flying machine, which operates near the very edge of a man's ability to control. The fighter pilot is engaged in the deadliest game of all, survival. He's either very good, or he's very dead. You're to fly to a target area at a very low altitude, using speed and terrain to avoid detection. Find, identify, and attack the target using optimum standoff tactics for your weapons. Hit the target and return to base. Oh yes, you're to accomplish this mission under the weather and at night. Lantern. Developed by Martin Marietta Corporation stands for Low Altitude Navigation and Targeting Infrared System for Night. It's the only system with which a fighter pilot can accomplish this mission. For air-to-ground attack missions, the system combines forward-looking infrared imaging, terrain-following radar, precision pointing and tracking, laser designation and ranging, and automatic weapons handoffs to minimize pilot workload. Integrated with the other aircraft avionics, Lantern provides a complete and effective attack system. Lantern is designed to allow the single-seat attack pilot to navigate and maneuver to and from a target area. The system provides the pilot with the capability to acquire, track, and attack ground targets under the weather day or night, down on the deck, where he can take advantage of terrain masking. 
Lantern gives the combat commander and his pilots the flexibility to use similar weapons and tactics to those they use in the daytime. The system enables the pilot to deliver conventional weapons with direct attack. He can also deliver infrared maverick or laser-guided bombs using proven standoff tactics. Lantern is a two-pod system, the navigation pod to get to the target and the targeting pod to attack. Lantern's navigation pod includes a terrain-following radar for precise low-altitude maneuvers in flight, and a wide field of view, forward-looking, infrared or FLIR sensor for navigation at night, and in reduced visibility conditions such as smoke, dust, dry haze, and smog. Flight testing has demonstrated the wide field of view navigation FLIR can be used as the pilot's night window both ground and airborne operations. In the air at night, the nav pod FLIR gives the pilot a clear and detailed image of the terrain. He can easily identify landmarks for navigation updates. The FLIR provides a visual backup to the terrain following radar for added confidence during low altitude flights. The symbology in the head up display provides the pilot with standard flight information including flight path marker, airspeed, altitude, heading, and navigation information. The Lantern's terrain following radar provides vertical command steering information and is presented as the TFR, or Fly 2 box. To fly his set clearance plane, the pilot flies the flight path marker into this TFR box. The FLIR picture allows the pilot to fly through saddles and around other terrain features for masking, rather than risking exposure during straight-ahead terrain following profiles. The TFR provides the pilot with the ability to cross peaks and ridges at the desired clearance. The pilot maintains his overall situation awareness in the HUD. He finds the target area and positions himself for attack with the navigation FLIR. He then transitions to the targeting pod FLIR. The targeting pod includes a precision gimbaled targeting FLIR with two fields of view, automatic trackers, a laser designator and ranger, an automatic correlator for missile handoff, and space for future automatic target recognition. The following is a demonstration of how a pilot would use Lantern to track a tactical target. Nav FLIR video is on the head-up display, and targeting FLIR video is on the head-down display. The pilot enters the target area, descending to low altitude, using the navigation information in the HUD. He switches targeting pod magnification from wide to narrow field of view. As he approaches the target area, the target box in the HUD is displayed over the predicted target location. The pilot transitions to the head-down display to acquire the target and initiate automatic tracking. After target lock-on, the attack is flown head-up, with all weapons delivery calculations and functions performed automatically. The missile bore sight correlator will automatically hand off the target to a Maverick missile and ready it for launch. Using the head down display, the pilot performs target recognition of the moving vehicle. The pilot identifies the target as a tank. The targeting pod tracker stays locked on even though the vehicle makes a sudden 180 degree turn. After the attack, the pilot turns away and leaves the target area at low altitude. This sequence demonstrates performance of the pod stabilization and tracking system during a high G attack maneuver. The pilot executes a 4G pull-up to 45 degree pitch, then a 4.5G slice-back maneuver.
The effectiveness of the targeting pod tracking system is demonstrated by this ground camera view of a laser-guided bomb strike. Lantern Navigation Pod Development Flight Testing began in July 1983 at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Nav Pod Operational Flight Testing was completed in December 1984 with a 93% mission success rate. The sorties were flown over Canada and the United States, simulating a European environment. On the strength of these test results, the Air Force approved production of the Lantern Navigation Pod. The first production nav pod was delivered in March 1987, one month ahead of schedule. Targeting pod development and testing followed the navigation pod schedule by one year. First production deliveries of the targeting pod began in July 1988. Lantern is the system which will make night low altitude attack missions a reality. With Lantern, Tactical Air Forces will be able to deny the adversary his traditional sanctuary of darkness. The F-16 must be a front-runner for the title of most versions in the shortest time. It's flown with both more advanced and less advanced engines, with special droop intake-mounted canards. And it was even proposed to build one with forward-swept wings, similar to the Grumman X-29. Probably the most radical design of an existing aircraft is the F-16 XL. Originally named SCAMP for supersonic cruise and maneuvering prototype, the F-16 XLs were rebuilt from the 5th and 6th Free Series aircraft. With an extended fuselage and the distinctive double delta or cranked arrow wing, they were intended to compete with the F-15E Strike Eagle. Both a single and two-seat version were flown. The wing area is more than twice the size of the original F-16. Internal fuel is up by 82%, and there are 17 weapon stations conformally blended into the wing, replacing drag-causing pylons. Commonality with the F-16C is put at 87%. While the Air Force decided to go with the F-15E, the F-16XL isn't finished yet as much of what was learned will be incorporated into future versions of the F-16, including the almost totally redesigned FSX version that's been selected by Japan. To maintain the capabilities of any high-performance aircraft in an ever-changing threat environment requires continual testing of new upgrades, new specialized mission applications. To meet these challenges, the F-16 Combined Test Force at Edwards Air Force Base are generating more Falcon flight hours than were flown during the aircraft's full-scale development over 10 years ago. During 1987, the Combined Test Force flew more than 1,800 missions, covering everything from performance and flying qualities to propulsion, avionics, and weapon systems. To accommodate the wide variety of testing, about 500 contractor and Air Force managers, pilots, engineers, and maintenance technicians are assigned to the test force. Some 15 fully instrumented aircraft are committed to these F-16 test programs. One of the new configurations being tested at Edwards is the F-16's abilities as an air defense fighter. Used in a combination of airborne surveillance aircraft, mid-air refueling, and ground-based radars, the F-16 will soon form the backbone of the U.S. Air Force's new North American air defense. These Falcons, which will be eventually flown by all 11 Air National Guard units, will not be new aircraft, but rather F-16As, withdrawn from active U.S. Air Force squadrons as those units are equipped with newer F-16C and D aircraft. The 270 F-16As selected for the air defense mission will retain their APG-66 radar but will be modified to carry either the AIM-7 Sparrow air-to-air -air missiles or the AIM-120 advanced medium-range air-to-air missile, in addition to the shorter-range infrared AIM-9 Sidewinder, a drag parachute, night identification spotlight, and two 600-gallon external fuel tanks will be added. All 270 retrofitted Vulcans will be operational in their new air defense role by 1990.
Every two years in October, the U.S. Air Force's best jet fighter teams come from all over the nation and overseas to the arid desert of Nevada, to Nellis Air Force Base, the renowned home of the fighter pilot. They represent the total Air Force. They are the proud men and women chosen to represent the best of fighter aircraft, pilots, maintenance, and expertise the Air Force has to offer. For 10 days, they've come to prove themselves out over 3 million acres of desolate Nevada desert. They've come to Gunsmoke. Let's listen as the commander of Tactical Air Command outlines the competition. Welcome to Gunsmoke, the biennial United States Air Force Worldwide Tactical Bombing and Gunnery Meet. This event, the third since its reestablishment in 1981, has provided the finest tactical air to ground gunnery teams in the United States Air Force the opportunity to demonstrate their ability to quickly load weapons, to generate sorties effectively, to navigate precisely, and to accurately put ordnance on target. In the past, Gunsmoke has been referred to as the Super Bowl of air-to-ground gunnery. This is an appropriate analogy, considering the high caliber of the teams representing the most talented individuals in their respective commands. Team participants, both aviators, loaders, and maintainers, have faced great competition just to make their wing team, and then to win their command competition prior to reaching this pinnacle. We have teams representing Tactical Air Command, the United States Air Forces in Europe, the Pacific Air Forces, the Alaskan Air Command, the Air National Guard, and the Air Force Reserve. Each team consists of four primary air crews plus a spare, 40 highly selected aircraft maintenance and weapons personnel, and five well-groomed aircraft. During the past two weeks, each member's skill and professionalism has been tested to the limit, beginning with the aircraft fly-in on Sunday, 6 October. The fly-in was timed to the 100th of a second. Five teams arrived in front of the control tower within three quarters of a second, a real photo finish. The air crews were given the opportunity to familiarize themselves with the Nellis Ranges on 8 and 9 October, and scored competition began on Thursday, 10 October. During the meet, teams flew two missions against each of three different target complexes. The single best mission of each type was selected for score in the individual and team competition. From the outset, it was abundantly clear that both air and ground crews had come to win. The competition was keen and the scores were extremely close. For example, only three and a half points out of a possible 2,500 points separated the leading air crews in the top gun competition as they took off for their last event. Equally important, the camaraderie and extraordinary cooperation among competitors in the air and on the ground has been superb. The benefits of the intense preparation by air crew and ground crew alike are legion and will be long enduring. For example, the procedures and techniques developed and finally honed to achieve the pinpoint bombing accuracy and near perfect gunnery scores during gunsmoking will enhance tactical air force's readiness for years to come. Approximately 1,100 people, including air crews, maintenance teams, weapons loaders, and judges, take part in the competition. As the commander mentioned, four aircraft from each team take part in the flying events, with the fifth machine and crew being on hand as a backup 
in the event of a last-minute problem with one of the primary aircraft. Gunsmoke is not just tactics. It's a realistic demonstration of a fighter pilot's ability to drop bombs and shoot bullets in a rigid given profile, and the maintenance team's ability to sign over optimum performance jets with which to complete that mission. Rivalry in the flying events is intense. A stronger term would have to be found for the maintenance competition. These crews are judged on how well their charges are maintained, how fast they can regenerate aircraft, and how quickly they can effect repair in the event of maintenance problems. They're also judged on their safety practices and ability to follow technical order procedures. This is a category in which even appearances count. And there are simply no dirty tools, uniforms, or aircraft anywhere in sight on the flight line. The weapons loading teams are under just as much pressure as all the other contestants taking part in gun smoke. The munitions crews are given 40 minutes to fuse and load six 500-pound bombs on their aircraft while being careful to observe all procedures and safety considerations. They're also judged on their procedures prior to starting the loading, as well as the condition and appearance of their tools.
One half point penalties are assessed for every second that the load times exceed 40 minutes. A bonus of one tenth of a point is awarded for every second the crews complete the loading within the 40 minute standard. pilot in full gear approaches his multi-million dollar airplane and returns his crew chief salute his first words are is it ready to go if the crew chief asserts that the fighter is ready pilot signs for it and begins his walk around inspection
professionalism is the number one priority for maintenance people. They have to know everything about the airplane, how it's performing, how and when to fix it. Plus, ensuring the job is done right the first time. A fighter pilot will not, cannot take off without the permission of his crew chief. A crew chief will not give his blessing, sign over the jet, unless he knows, beyond most human comprehension, the jet is worthy of life itself. jet onto their backsides, using it as an extension of their mind, body, and soul. Preparation for each individual flight is critical to success and the sought-after top marks. The pilots have briefed in detail, and the maintenance crews have painstakingly readied the aircraft and its weapons. Flying fighters requires coiled tension, single purpose of mind, unwavering calculation, and intent resolution riding on the fine edge of total control in a high-risk environment where a hundred things could go wrong. Those with the finest skills, highest levels of contingency preparation, most luck will this day take the title as best of the best. Each team will take off and fly in four ship formations, enter their impact area, and according to one of three mission profiles, will peel out into single ship in trail or two ship combat formation. Roll in and rake the target with small 25 pound dummy bombs, 500 pound Mark 82 bombs, or 20 or 30 millimeter cannon fire. Depending on the type of aircraft, they'll fly as low as 100 feet above the ground, as fast as 450 knots, while attempting to hit tank sized bullseye targets within a three to nine meter radius. Anything outside of three meters will penalize the air crews. Air crews will be judged in three events, basic weapons delivery, tactical bomb delivery, and navigation attack. In all events, the teams get two opportunities to achieve their best scores, with the highest score being used to compute the final standings. Established during the 250 missions which are flown in just six days. 90 aircraft and 1,100 personnel who take part are tested, stretched to their limits and beyond. In the final analysis, every competition has to declare a winner, and Gunsmoke is no different in that respect. However, there really are no losers at Gunsmoke either. Every pilot, every electronic warfare officer, 
every maintenance technician, every ordnance stacker, and even the aircraft at the competition were all there because they were the best in their units, and their units had already proven to be winners in their own commands. The Thunderbird, the most enduring of all the legends of the North American Indians. Many thought the Thunderbird controlled nearly all the powers that man could imagine, especially the invisible forces of good conquering evil and light overcoming darkness. Reports of the Thunderbirds varied from one great Indian nation to another. Crude drawings and burnt outlines on leather and buckskin depict the bird in typical southwestern Indian colors of red, white, and blue. The Indians believed that thunder was caused by the mighty bird flapping its wings. Lightning was believed to flash from its eyes, or from two arrows carried in its talons to be hurled to earth. In 1953, the Air Force chose the name Thunderbirds for its aerial demonstration team. Thunderbirds. No other name will do. No other name could do. And now, accompanied by the music of John Seary, let's check it out firsthand. At this point, these aircraft are generating more than 100,000 pounds of thrust. Clear now. is wondrously beautiful. But keep in mind, behind the beauty of each maneuver, the Thunderbird pilots are constantly executing the diverse and intricate combat flying skills taught to all Air Force pilots during their training. These men train extremely hard to perfect their combat flying skills in the world's most advanced fighters and are here to show you what their skill and courage behind an incredible performer like the F-16 means to the free world. What was written so many years ago by John Gillespie McGee still rings true today. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth, danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed, joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds, done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung, high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through the footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue. I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God.
banking sharply, executes a high G turn of 360 degrees with a radius barely wider than three and a half football fields. A demonstration of why the F-16 is considered the world's most maneuverable fighter. Now, the diamond formation from the opposite direction making the same maneuver, only this time with an added dimension. A wingtip to wingtip formation. To sustain a precision formation while in a continuous high G-force requires exceptional pilot physical condition, coordination, and proficiency. Thunderbird Solo enters again to perform the maximum climb. In seconds, the F-16 climbs from ground level to over 12,000 feet, demonstrating the tremendous thrust and rolling performance of the F-16. in hot pursuit of the diamond. Though it's hard to detect Solo's profile, he's there and coming at a closure rate in excess of 10 miles per minute. His challenge, catch the diamond right here at show center. Thousand. Impossible. One thousand. Let's see. Show center. Solo is now pulling five times his body weight in G-force. And yet, under such pressure, he must precisely execute complex, ever-changing angles and airspeeds to overtake and slide smoothly into formation with the diamond. The Thunderbird air demonstration is designed to test men and aircraft to the upper limits of their abilities. You might call it a proficiency test of the red, white, and blue. Let's watch several key moments that further demonstrate the proficiency of these men and their advanced aircraft. into one sensational finale, the Thunderbird's most popular maneuver, the bomb rate nearing 1,000 miles per hour, each of the four pilots must continuously and accurately compensate for winds and relative position by changing airspeed and direction as needed. 
the difficult, made to look easy. Behind any F-16 pilot and his precision flying is a large, talented corps of specialists and support people who keep the F-16s flying around the clock and around the world. Call it what you will, dedication, teamwork, or attention to detail, they all fit. This presentation is dedicated to those men and women who build and maintain the F-16 Fighting Falcon. Indeed, a bird of prey.